Um, thanks everyone for coming. This presentation is called Radical Recycler View. And I wrote it because I've never seen a presentation where someone just said, these are all the crazy things you can do with a recycler view, and then tried to explain how. So I'm gonna try to explain how. Uh, my name is Lisa Ray, and I work at a startup called Genius. And to give you a little background on some examples that I might show from our app, we're a music and tech company that started by explaining rap and hip hop lyrics. And today we do everything from Justin Bieber to Kendrick Lamar. So this will be a practical guide to achieving complex layouts in a recycler view. And you may ask what's so special about recycler view that I wanna talk about it for 45 minutes as opposed to any other layout. And the answer is a question of scale. Recycler view is by far the biggest layout there is in Android. And that's because a recycler view is actually a viewport into a huge virtual layout. A linear layout or recycler view can only contain as much content as the viewport, but a recycler view can contain five times as much, 10 times as much, maybe even a theoretically infinite amount if you keep loading content into it. I promise I only put like four of them on this screen. And it introduces almost a whole new architecture for views than we're used to. For starters, now we have this concept of an item. And it's not clear what it's supposed to be. It's not a fragment, but it's not just an Android view. Um, it's not a custom view either, or it doesn't have to be. It's some compromise between what you would consider a logical subcomponent of a screen and a reasonably small, efficient, reusable Android view group. And finally, there's this whole concept of view recycling, which is like another life cycle inside the standard activity life cycle. Your items, whatever the hell they are, are now having a day like those guys in Mad Max. They live, they die, they live again. So that's pretty unusual. Um, if you're not already familiar with Recycler View, how the components are built, why they're built that way, you may be a little lost in this talk, but um, if you're watching this on video, I would recommend going and finding either of these as a primer, watching it, and then coming back. So, just so we're all on the same page, I'm gonna do a quick overview of basic recycler view components that we'll talk about. The recycler view is pretty obvious. It's creating, binding, and recycling our views. The adapter is providing data. The layout manager is laying out and positioning. Um, then we get a little weirder. The item decoration is the one who adds offsets. It draws over and it draws under. The item animator is animating changes. Um, the item touch helper is helping you swipe, maybe to delete, drag and drop. Um, the snap helper is new in the last couple of releases and it creates sort of view pager-like scrolls, not exactly the same. And diffutil calculates changes for you. So there are default implementations of a lot of these. Um, it's kind of amazing to me that Google built a framework without an item click listener, uh, but drag and drop is easy. But what do I know? Um, but for the recycler view, that one's pretty standard. I'm um, adapter. Um, for layout manager, the main ones everyone is going to use either a linear layout manager or a grid layout manager. There's a default item animator. Uh, for item touch helper, there's a simple item touch helper with a simple callback. It's good when things are simple. For snap helper, the default implementation is a linear snap helper, which snaps to the center and diffutil is just diffutil. Okay, cool. So first, I wanna start with some things that look like they should be hard, but are actually easy, so that we get off on a good note. So the first I wanna talk about is a carousel. And by this, I mean an item in a vertically scrolling list that itself scrolls horizontally, or vice versa. I know you, a lot of you probably won't believe me that this is easy, because it was a complete pain in the ass in list view. Um, I've tried to forget all the stuff you had to do to delegate touch handling. In a recycler view, you just make an item with a recycler view in it and give it a, li a linear layout manager that is the opposite of your main list. So for this one, my main list is vertical, it's horizontal. That's really it, there's no trick. You don't have to do anything special to delegate the touch, it just works. Um, this is how the lean back library works. I believe this is how Google Play works. And when I say, literally just, this is what I mean, this is your item. And then in onCreate, 
You're going to create a new linear layout manager, set it on the recycler view, set any item decoration you want, and then on bind, you'll set the particular adapter for that row. So you can have lots of carousels. And another thing which is compl complicated to implement on your own, but is now pretty much handed to us, is scroll snapping. And by this, I mean that a scroll wants to stop at a particular position, and if you pick your finger up at another one, it will scroll back or forward. And the class to accomplish this, Snap Helper, was released in the 24.1 version of the support lib, which I think means a lot of people don't know about it. Um, but you should, because it's really easy. Um, you literally just make a Snap Helper, and then you call Snap Helper attached to Recycler view. The default one does center snapping, um, but I was interested for a project in having mine snap to the top. So I googled recycler view snap helper, and the first one I found was somebody who had helpfully made one that snaps to various gravities. And it seems to work great. If you want to implement your own, uh, there's three methods which basically say how far you are from the item and so forth. Um, but I really can't imagine why most people will need to. And while we're on the topic of snapping, um, you can get behavior reminiscent of a view pager using Snap Helper by setting each individual item to match parent. And it's, when I first did this, I thought, what does that even mean in the context of a recycler view? But it means it matches the parent viewport. Uh, the difference between view pager and doing this with a Snap Helper is that you can't fling a view pager, whereas you can fling a snapping recycler view. Uh, you can also overshoot the next item and be snapped back. Uh, so some things to think about. Uh, you also can't use a fragment in a recycler view. Yeah. And the final one in here that I'll talk about is swipe to delete and also drag and drop. Very similar. So for swipe to delete, you can implement um, this callback for an item touch helper. This structure is a little weird, and I have to look it up every time because I don't remember. You make an item touch helper. This is a class given to you, and that calls your custom callback. Then you call item touch helper attached to recycler view. Inside your callback, there are two arguments for the constructor. The first is the flags for dragging and dropping, which directions you would like people to drag and drop. The second is which directions you want to swipe. If you don't want to drag and drop, pass zero. If you don't want to swipe, pass zero. If you only want to swipe certain items or drag and drop certain items, pass zero. And then you can override get swipe directions or get uh, drag directions. And you can check whatever criteria you want about your view holder to decide whether or not it's one that you want to be swipeable or drag droppable. You can even have one default for the whole list except for certain views. And as far as getting into the details, um, you get a callback on swiped. That's when it's done all the animation for you, the user has finally released, and it's going to be swiped off. So this is when you get to do your modification to the adapter. And don't forget to notify. You still have to say it's been removed from the adapter. Because you could let them swipe it off and then be like, nah, just kidding. Um, and you can also have an optional override of on child draw. So you can see that here, what I chose to do is fade the view out proportionally more as its x translation increased. And I'm using absolute value of that so that it gets more faint on either side. You probably don't want to do much on drag drop. Um, for drag and drop, the only difference is that instead of on swiped, you're going to implement on move. Um, and finally, diffutil, another real time saver. So it's a pretty common pattern that you get a notification from your server saying something has changed, and then you have to go re-download the home page or whatever. So in the context of my example app, I have two different pages of colors. The problem is with Recycler View, if you don't know what has changed, you're pretty much breaking the single commandment of Recycler View which is that you should notify as precisely as possible and not just blow away your whole data set. 
And that's why we have all of these nice individual precise notification methods to call. And there is a notify change, but if possible, you should avoid using it. So diffutil helps you take when you genuinely have two lists and might not know in advance what the change was, and it generates them for you. And it's just a couple lines of code. You call diffutil.calculate diff. It creates a diff result, and you pass it your custom callback. This is a pattern I'm seeing a lot today. Um, then you have to actually change the data in your adapter yourself, like normal, clear the adapter, replace the data set, do whatever you do, but then you dispatch the updates that diffutil calculated for you to the adapter. So that's pretty easy. The callback itself has a couple more methods. It wants to know what are the sizes of the old and new list, but the important ones are, are items the same and are contents the same? Are items the same is usually referring to a comparison of the ID number if you have objects coming from a database. If you're refreshing a home page, is this literally the same article? Is it talking about the same thing? Our contents the same means, did something visual change about the way we're going to render it? Should it be rebound? So if you implement these two, then diffutil will go through and figure it out for you what's the most efficient way to update this list. And it looks kind of like that. So on to a larger conversation. And this one sounds simpler, but I have found is actually more of a pain in implementation. Multiple view types happen to the best of us. And the longer you work on an app, you probably know the view types just sort of multiply, like bunnies. And they're a huge pain point. So starting with list views, a lot of us were used to making view types by writing them out in a list like this, with this monotonically increasing integer, and at the end, a number saying how many of them we have. And this leads to adapters, which look something like this, where you have long switch statements inflating various layouts, and then it leads to adapters which have bind methods like this with switch statements with lots and lots of logic. I could only fit one simple one on this slide. And pretty soon, this will be your adapter. <laughs> so there's a better way. Uh, and the first way I ever saw this approach was kind of clever, which was a delegate pattern, which gets some things right. You don't want the logic in the adapter. Um, and then your adapter ends up looking something kind of like this. For every new view type, you register a delegate, and then the delegate will do all that implementation. The problem is that you need to add a new delegate for every view type, so there's still something for you to forget. And that's boilerplate you just don't need. So first of all, the better way is forget these item types. If you still have them, get rid of them. I'm not the first one to say this, but you already have unique IDs generated uh, by the Android build system for you. You can use these, there's no need for them to be continuous, and you don't need to know how many view types you have. So that means there's nothing for you to update when you make a new view type. And then what I recommend is delegating the creation, binding, and getting the view type, which is also your layout, to a wrapper class. So instead of having a list of songs, you'll have a list of items, which could be song items or other items, but the item itself is an, either an interface or an abstract class which enforces this pattern. And you can implement this yourself. Um, I want to mention a library that was released recently that I actually really like. I think it's a well thought out abstraction for this same general solution. It's called Epoxy and it was released by Airbnb. So if anyone here is from Airbnb, good job guys. <laughs> Um, and I'll show you an example using their library. So to use epoxy, you'll make an epoxy adapter, and then their equivalent of item is an epoxy model. So you'll extend that and make a new, say, header model or song model, and you add those models to your adapter. And then a model for an individual view is gonna look something like this, and you can see how similar this is to what we came up with internally. It's knowing how to bind itself. It knows what layout should be inflated, which is also its view type, A plus. 
And the only downside is that you still need either a custom view or a custom view holder for each item. So there's still a bit of boilerplate. So if a way to get rid of that completely is, I know I'm kind of merging worlds here, but you can consider data binding. Um, if you'd like to have one view holder for your entire recycler view, and you'd like that view holder to look like this, then this is something you should think about. Um, if you've heard me talk about data binding, you know that it generates a binding class with references to each view in the layout it inflates, each named view, which sounds an awful lot like a view holder, right? So that's pretty convenient for, um, for a recycler view. Moving on to a closely related topic, I'll talk about multiple columns. And the way that 99% of people probably should accomplish multiple columns is by using a grid layout manager. And there's this constructor. There's also another one which takes four arguments um, if you want to change the direction. This one gives you a vertical grid layout manager. The span count is the total number of possible columns into which you can divide items using this grid layout manager. A question may be how to choose a span count and how crazy can you really go with this. My recommendation is that you use the least common multiple, often also referred to as the greatest common denominator, but it's really called the least common multiple, <laughs> of all your desired column splits. So if I want a single column, I also want double columns, I also want triple columns, and also I want quadruple columns. The least common multiple of all of those is 12, so I'll set my span count to 12. If you find that you have what seems to be a ridiculously large span count, that's okay. The performance hit comes from inflating tons and tons and tons of tiny little items, not from just fundamentally having a high span count. That's just a bit of arithmetic. Also, if you're often showing a single list, say in one orientation, and when you rotate, you show a grid, there's no need to go swapping between linear layout manager and grid layout manager. You can just use a span equal to your whole span count. Make your life easy. There's no huge performance gain. So by default, a grid layout manager places every item in one span. So we'll have 12 items across in our example. Uh, it's probably not what we want, so to get different spans per view type, we'll set a span size lookup on the grid layout manager. And you may be thinking that this switch statement looks familiar. And in that case, you're right. It is a pattern that we saw before and we're trying to get rid of. So my recommendation is that you delegate this span decision to the individual wrapper class, to the item itself. And that lets you have a great deal of flexibility. Not only does it clean up your code, but it makes your list more efficient because it means that you don't have to have separate view types and inflate more views just to have your items vary in span count. So in this example, the item is telling what its own span size is. In this example, because we don't rely solely on view type, um, to produce span size, all of these items are of the same view type, even though they obviously have different spans. So that can help you. An unusual example is something that we did in the Genius app. Um, so mixed columns are obviously useful for flowing grid layouts. They're useful for making flexible grid layouts, but they're also useful for things like columns of text. So there's a little show they're putting on in New York recently it's so popular, even I can't get tickets. And these lyrics are very popular with users of the Genius app, but they were a problem for displaying on the mobile app because Hamilton is a musical, and musical librettos are usually laid out with text side by side to represent people singing simultaneously. So assigning sometimes as much as four. Assigning span sizes to our body paragraphs on the fly finally let us render this libretto correctly and made a lot of Hamilton fans very, very happy. Next, I want to talk about groups. So this one I'm kind of going out on a limb and giving you my personal opinion, but you're all stuck here, so. We do know that not all items in a list are equal. If there were, there would be only three insertion scenarios at the beginning of the list, at the end of the list, or in some kind of sorted order. 
And um, although there is a class I forgot to mention called sorted list that can handle this for you, we're not talking about that case of a homogeneous list. We're talking about a really crazy one. So I refer to these sub-collections of items that happen in your adapter as groups, because they're logical groupings of items. And you'll often find that the content for these groups is loaded out of order, or asynchronously, or that you want to update one without disturbing the others, and that you want to notify accurately when you do. But why is this so complicated? So I made an example to show. This is an example page of fairly typical complexity, maybe not artistry. And so you can click to see authors, you can click to see comments, and at the bottom are ways to reach more content. So we click on view comments, but they're probably not loaded. We can see where they should go. In fact, it's even likely that your click handler told you what position was clicked and therefore where they should go. But we go load them from the server and wait what happened. So now, if we put the comments at our saved index, then that's wrong. We need to get the new index, which would be five, because two items were inserted. So the moral of the story is, holding onto the adapter position of a view at any time, anywhere, will screw you. In the view holder, in the list, in a listener, if you hold onto it, you're doing it wrong. It may not bite you now, but it will bite you later. Probably in production. So the most standard out of the box way to avoid doing this is just to hold references. So this is with um, a pretty generic adapter. This is sort of pseudocode. So I'm holding a reference to the header in my list. And that way, when my comments come back from the server, I can then ask the adapter, at this moment, what is the position of my header? You can imagine you're probably doing this using index of or something like that. With that new index, which is correct at this moment, add the comments to the list and then notify. So this works. But what about when you collapse that group again, when you collapse the comments? Do you go and find the index of each of these comments individually and remove them again? What happens when they expand it again? So you can see this becomes complicated very quickly. Epoxy has actually put some thought into this. Um, so this is how it would work using epoxy. You would hold on again to the specific header, and then when your comments come back, you would make a list of comment models. And then because we have the reference to the header, we can use this relative insertion method, insert model after, and we could iterate the list in reverse order, inserting them after the header. Um, and it also notifies for us, so that's cool. And finally, it also lets you show and hide content which is still logically present. For example, your user probably perceives that the comments are still in the list somehow, even if they're collapsed. So this lets you think about it that way also. On the hand, other hand, this code is still a bit low level and to be honest, a little gross. So I suggested perhaps we can do better and this is what we've been developing in parallel at Genius over the last year and a half and why I was so surprised to see an incredibly similar library um, as epoxy. Um, the mechanics of abstracting away multiple view boilerplate are very simple, similar, but the intention of Groupy was to be much more high level. So in Groupy, you can add groups of items directly to the adapter. You can also add items directly to the adapter. You can mix them if you want. Uh, but the intention is that it's going to make it easy for you when you need to handle these logical groups. Um, an expandable group is one of the classes it ships with. So in this example, we would add the title at the top of the article, and then we'd make a new header for the comments section, make a new expandable group using that header, and then add that to the group adapter. Now we're all set up to go, so when we get our list of comments from the server, we can simply add them to the expandable group and toggle it expanded. And then when we're done with it, we can toggle it back uh, to collapse. So an expanding group is just one of the groups that are possible using Groupy. Um, probably my favorite visual of this whole presentation is updating group. We took the concept of diffutil. Instead of dispatching those changes to an adapter, we did to our own callback. Um, because there is a base class, uh, there's a group 
interface, and there's a base class called nested group. You can make your own groups behave any way you like. You can even nest them indefinitely. Um, so this is a flexible and not very prescriptive interface you can use to help you out. Um, so we use an updating group on two places on our homepage. One is for recently played songs, and another is when we get these undifferentiated new homepage lists to move around our hot songs. And the concept of groups has also let us provide essentially mini adapters to the list. We've been able to reorder items to form uh, vertical columns, for example. And this is still using a standard grid layout manager, so the adapter itself is not involved in this magic trick. It doesn't know anything about it. The reordering is happening within the group. And it also lets us decompose complex views, which might take a lot of time to inflate and bind, into smaller, more efficient pieces, while still keeping the logical encapsulation in our code that would come with a single item. So I'm not the first person to originate this idea. I've actually heard it described at multiple talks by Facebook and by Instagram and probably other people. But since they didn't open source anything, I had to build my own. And all my example code from this presentation is in the example app for Groupie. So even if you have no intention or interest in using groups, I encourage you to check out the example app because it took a long time. And I don't want to be one of those people giving a presentation just to push the library. I swear it's worth it. Um, you don't have to use ours, but if you do make a really, really long, complex list, I encourage you to use something, even if you, it's homegrown, because otherwise your list becomes this house of cards, and you're terrified to change any bit of it. Um, item decorations. I don't want to talk about adding dividers to your list because that's been done a million times. Instead, I'm going to lead you through a few simple examples to show the kind of flexibility and also complexity that you can get into with an item decoration. So an item decoration only has three methods. The first adds offsets, which you might think of as padding. The second draws below your item, and the second draws over your item. I don't tend to draw over much, but it's good to know it's there. So first we'll look at get item offsets. This is a pretty common request. And on the face of it, it seems like a really simple solution, too. If you Google this, the first answers on Stack Overflow are to put half of your desired padding on the outside of the recycler view, and then half of the desired padding on the right and left of each item. So if you turn on this fancy debug item decoration that I built, which you'll find in my GitHub project, um, you can see what's going on here. There's half the padding on the outside, half on the left, half on the right. Simple. And if I, if you didn't know this already, I would feel bad if I didn't tell you. You can also have scroll off padding on the top and bottom of your recycler view by using padding top or bottom and clip to padding false. I learned this like three years ago and it blew my mind. Still works, worked with list view, still works with recycler view. Okay, complex solution. What if we can no longer use the padding on the outside of our recycler view because we have a full bleed item because we've been reading the material design spec or our designers have? Now we can't use that padding. OK, what if we ask which items are on the left and right edges, and we put two times the padding there? We can find this out, by the way. And it's really useful if you want to do something like draw a rectangle around a whole section. So you actually have a ton of information here to make that decision. You're being handed the individual view and the parent recycler view. For starters, of course, you can get the view holder which should tell you if this item decoration even cares about this view, like its view type, any custom tags you've set on it. You can get the view's layout parameters, and you can also get the whole layout manager. So you really have a lot of control here. From that, you can get how many columns this individual item is supposed to span, and you can get the total span size of the whole recycler view. And then finally, by asking the layout parameters, what column does this item start in, and how many columns does it take up, and comparing that to the total span size, you can find if it touches the right edge of the list. By asking if it starts in uh, column zero, you can find if it's on the left side of the list. And there, we can set our full padding. The default case would be to set half of it. So let's see what this looks like. Something really weird happened. This isn't always noticeable. But if you have, in any way, a square view in your item that depends on the width, you will see this happening. 
So we have different sized squares, and that's because when we added those offsets, they don't change the original measured space laid aside for the item. So this was originally divided in three, and then we inset the middle one just a little, and the outside one's more. So they're smaller. And if you look at, um, if you look at what's really going on, you can see each item needs the same total amount of padding on it. And the only way to accomplish that and get larger borders at the edge is to have it kind of creatively distributed. I spent a long time doing this math. I, I remember my algebra, and I have concluded that <laughs> knowing the number of columns and the column index of the item in an evenly spaced grid, this is the correct formula. I'm also not the first person to come up with this. I discovered it on Stack Overflow after I wrote it. But if you need to look it up, uh, it's also <laughs> on this example project. So this is an example of something that is more difficult than it looks. Oh, here's the debug item decoration. It's fun to play with. You can see what's actually going on. More fun things is that item decorations are additive, meaning you can add lots of them, and they're influenced by what happens in the previous ones. So suppose we had the first item decoration we just wrote, which adds equal padding around the edges of all of our items, and then we had a second decoration just for our headers, which is gonna draw behind them. Which is gonna draw behind them. So in onDraw, we're gonna do something very simple like this. This is a common pattern in onDraw if you haven't seen it before. You're gonna ask the recycler view, how many visible children do you have? And then iterate through them. And for each child, if it's a type you care about, do something. In this case, we're asking it for its bounds, and then we're drawing a rectangle behind it. Like I said. Unfortunately, this doesn't turn out the way you might imagine. There's a gap around the edge, and this is because the header decoration has no idea that the view has an inset because it didn't set it. So the next step here is to use the decorated bounds of a view, something I wish I had known two years ago. And it draws, um, this is drawing the solid color behind the whole header by asking the layout manager, get decorated top, get decorated bottom. And this gets the whole complete sum of all the offsets all the decorators have set. So that's better. But suppose, just hang with me here, that we wanted to let the user reorder the entire group by dragging these headers. But with our current decoration, this happens. The header background is stuck and the text is floating. So if we wanna avoid this, then we need to also take into account the view's translation. <laughs> so if we add the translation Y to both dimensions and the X to other two dimensions and then draw this rectangle, it's going to look more like this, which is better. Depending on your use case, you sometimes may not want to take into account translation, but sometimes you do. So it's good to know about your options. And there are some other times you might want to get the position of the view in the list while you're binding it. So this might be an undraw or it might be in get offsets. I did this once because I wanted to know whether it was an odd numbered item in a, in a grid of two, too wide. There are probably better things to do for that. If you are doing this, whether you're using it to find if it's the first or last in the list, or you have two columns, if your item is ever moved, this is now no position. So if you're drawing something behind your item and then it animates, your background will just disappear. I found this out the hard way. So what you want to do instead is ask for the layout position. And you can also get this directly from the view holder. That layout position will work much better and you won't get jumping. Um, I've spent this whole presentation completely focused on linear and grid layout managers. Um, and of course, you can do almost literally anything with a layout manager. But 99% of use cases won't require that. And unfortunately, I simply don't have time to explain how to write one. But I will mention that Android also comes with a staggered grid, 
made famous by apps like Pinterest and Etsy. It's a really distinct look, but if you need one, you've got one. They wrote it for you. And another effect that people often ask me about is a spanned grid. So what's not possible here to achieve with a grid layout manager is that one of the items is spanning both columns and rows. This isn't possible without making one big gigundo item on top. So if you need this, uh, and this is example is pocket casts. If you need one tomorrow, your best option is a library called Two Way View uh, by Lucas Roca, and it gives you a lot of options. It's built on top of Layout Manager and it's pretty configurable. On the downside, it's not really documented and it's only available as Maven snapshots. So, if you have to or if you want to build your own, uh, then this tutorial by Dave Smith is the best one that I've found for explaining how. I just want you to know that before you attempt this, a custom layout manager is not for the faint of heart. It's gonna take you a long time, and if you change the way your list needs to behave, then you also have to change your layout manager. So know that it's there, just don't, don't go down this path lightly. So, as a wise man once said, with great power comes great responsibility. Don't let one adapter or one long list have all of the responsibility for managing your recycler view. Break your multiple view types into items. Break them into groups. Make it easier on yourself by using the helper classes Google has written, which are more of them every day. And with that, happy recycling. <laughs>